In our last session together, we were examining these proclamations that were issued by the Continental Congress during the turbulent years of the Revolutionary War, proclamations that literally allow us tremendous insight into the heart and soul of the founders of our country. We would do well to sit up and pay attention. The final proclamation that was issued by the Founding Fathers came on October 18th, 1783, and it is indeed a fitting closure to the great conflict that they had engaged in for so many years. Let's read this together. Whereas it hath pleased the supreme ruler of all human events to dispose the hearts of the late belligerent powers to put a period to the effusion of human blood by proclaiming a cessation of all hostilities by sea and land. And these United States are not only happily rescued from the dangers and calamities to which they have been so long exposed, but their freedom, sovereignty, and independence ultimately acknowledged. And whereas in the progress of a contest on which the most essential rights of human nature depended, the interposition of divine providence in our favor hath been most abundantly and most graciously manifested. And the citizens of these United States have every reason for praise and gratitude to the God of their salvation. Impressed, therefore, with an exalted sense of the blessings by which we are surrounded, and of our entire dependence on that almighty being from whose goodness and bounty they are derived, the United States and Congress assembled do recommend it to the several states to set apart the second Thursday in December next as a day of public thanksgiving, that all the people may then assemble to celebrate with grateful hearts and united voices the praises of their supreme and all-bountiful benefactor for his numberless favors and mercies. That he hath been pleased to conduct us in safety through all the perils and vicissitudes of the war. And that he hath given us unanimity and resolution to adhere to our just rights. That he hath raised up a powerful ally to assist us in supporting them and hath so far crowned our united efforts with success, that in the course of the present year, hostilities have ceased, and we are left in the undisputed possession of our liberties and independence, and of the fruits of our own lands, and in the free participation of the treasures of the sea. That he hath prospered the labor of our husbandmen with plentiful harvests, and above all, notice as we've seen in other proclamations after listing these tremendous blessings from God, they say, and above all, that he hath been pleased to continue to us the light of the blessed gospel and secured to us in the fullest extent the rights of conscience in faith and worship. Let's pause there for one moment. Notice that the founders are saying, that over the years as we've been fighting this, this war with uh, our British oppressors, uh, he has blessed us right and left and accomplished so many things to our benefit. But above all, he's left us with the gospel of Christ. And therefore, in the midst of, of all of the founders' hopes and dreams and all of their goals of establishing a national independence, notice that in the final analysis, they said what we really need to praise God about here and be thankful for is that we, in fact, are in possession of the true religion that will enable us to be uh, successful and to survive now as a national entity. They gave God credit for all of that. And notice the emphasis then upon the need to have faith and worship. And while our hearts overflow with gratitude and our lips set forth the praises of our divine Creator, that we also offer up fervent supplications, that it may please Him to pardon all our offenses, to give wisdom and unanimity to our public councils, to cement all our citizens in the bonds of affection, and to inspire them with an earnest regard for the national honor and interest. We so desperately need that today. 
and to enable them to improve the days of prosperity by every good work, and to be lovers of peace and tranquility, that he may be pleased to bless us in our husbandry, our commerce, and navigation, to smile upon our seminaries and means of education, to cause pure religion and virtue to flourish, there's Christianity, Christian morality, to give peace to all nations, and to fill the world with His glory. Again, even though you and I have been listening to what I would call revisionist historians for some 50 years now, when you see these proclamations, all 15 of them, you look into the hearts of these men who very clearly indicated the true orientation, the true, shall we say, thrust of their efforts in establish, establishing us as an independent nation. And notice that this proclamation, given here at the end of a string of 15 proclamations, this proclamation makes it abundantly clear that God is to receive complete credit for winning the war and achieving independence and national existence. Folks, if we are literally at a point in time in this country where our leaders and a majority of our citizens no longer look to God, no longer credit God with our existence and our success and prosperity as a nation, then it follows according to both God, the Bible, and according to the founders. We cannot expect our national existence to continue. Let's turn our attention now to the fact that these men held very cogent, clear, plainly expressed views regarding the role of Christianity in the formation of the nation. And what I'd like for us to do in looking back over these 15 proclamations that you yourself have seen with your own eyes, I would like for us to summarize to synthesize and, and sort of classify these central concepts that are articulated in these proclamations. So what I've done is I've sat down with all 15, I've used their words, their terminology, and collated them where you can see clearly the specific concepts that they so fervently and so ardently expressed in these proclamations. Let's begin first with the Founders' view of God. Here's the terminology they used. They said He is the supreme ruler of the universe. He is sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. He is the righteous governor of the world. He is the disposer of all events. He is the great creator. And He is the arbiter of the fate of nations. These are all their expressions, their terminology. Also, they maintained, they expressed the fact that God is integrally and intimately active in exerting His providence and involving Himself in the affairs of nations. They said He possesses the capability to bless or destroy a nation, to deliver or to punish peoples, depending upon their actions, their own spiritual condition. Further, the founders tell us this great God of ours is infinite in all of His attributes. Listen to some of the terms that they used, or read some of the terms that they used to refer to God's character and God's eternal attributes. They refer to His love, His grace, His compassion, His kindness, His mercy, His benevolence, His goodness, wisdom, and wrath. They refer to His justice, His omnipotence, His providential aid, His protection, and of course, His assistance. That's their terms. So they saw God actively involved and exhibiting His righteous character. And notice also that they made it clear in these proclamations that all people, notice that, not just Americans, every nation on the planet, all human beings on the planet, all six plus billion people are under obligation to acknowledge Him, to obey Him, to praise Him, to thank Him, to seek His favor, 
and his blessings and his interposition. And isn't it incredible that they said it is human responsibility to beg him for forgiveness for breaking his laws? Let me show you a listing of some of the uh, specific expressions that were used by the founders to refer to God. Number one, of course, providence. Heaven. That's a term, by the way, that's used in the Bible to refer to God. Heaven. Great governor of the world. Great governor of the universe. Righteous governor of the world. Lord of hosts. God of armies. Supreme disposer of all events. All wise, omnipotent, and merciful disposer of all events. Arbiter of the fate of nations. Almighty God. Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. Divine benefactor. Father of all mercies. God of all grace. What a tremendous listing of terms. Here are a few others. Our great creator, our gracious benefactor, the supreme being, the ruler of the universe, the giver of all good, the God of their salvation, almighty being, supreme and all bountiful benefactor, the supreme ruler of all human events. I want you to notice that Contrary to the revisionist historians who say that the founders believed in kind of a general presence, a general deity, but not really the personality that we read about in the Bible, the God of the Bible, that is simply not true. When you put all of these expressions together, they are describing the God of the Bible, who is the creator as the, the account of Genesis tells us. Let's look now at what the founders had to say in these uh, proclamations specifically about Jesus Christ. And we saw they were very vocal about affirming the truth of the Christian religion. But notice, notice the reverent and honorable way in which the founders refer to Christ himself. The fact that he is the divine and gracious Redeemer, Lord, and blessed Savior. They say he died on the cross for human sin which makes him the mediator by which pardon, forgiveness, and eternal glory are achieved. And they made very clear that all people must render allegiance to Jesus and to the Christian religion. Here specifically are the expressions that the founders used in these proclamations to refer to Jesus. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our divine Redeemer, our gracious Redeemer, our blessed Savior. Now let's look at the listing as you, as you gather all of these 15 proclamations together and examine specifically what they say about religion. Well, it's very clear they speak of Christianity. And here's the terminology that they used. It is the one true religion from God. Knowledge of God's will via the gospel of Christ and the kingdom or church of Christ must be promoted universally throughout the entire world. The religion of Christ is the foundation. Notice what they said. Christianity is the foundation of independence, public prosperity, and national happiness. How many people believe that today? Further, notice what the founder said about the Bible itself, and how important the Bible is to our civilization. They said, it is the repository of the inspired, holy laws of God, by which all nations, all citizens, all people are to be governed. They said the Old Testament has tremendous significance today. In fact, they quoted from it frequently in terms of its application to nations, but they very specifically said, the New Testament is the portion of the Bible that promulgates the precepts of Jesus Christ. And then notice what the founders said about sin. Amazing that they would see this as part of the purview of a politician. Violations of God's will. Well, what is that? How do you know what God's will is? Well, as defined by the Bible, His Word. Violations of God's will are susceptible to God's displeasure. In fact, citizens must acknowledge their guilt, confess their transgressions, fast and pray to God for His forgiveness, 
amend their lives, and then strive to live faithfully to Him. Moving from that point, what the founder said about human action that constitutes sin, what did the founder say in these proclamations is the responsibility of the citizens of a nation, citizen obligations. Oh, they were very specific about that as well. They said, citizens must obey the laws of God in order for the nation to be successful and to last. They said prayer, fasting, and humility are all part of being a citizen, absolutely necessary to being a worthwhile citizen of the United States. They said citizens must openly admit their unworthiness and their dependence on God. Citizens must strive to be virtuous and to promote piety in their sphere of influence. And they also made very clear, generally at the very end of these proclamations, that citizens must assemble to worship God and abstain from labor in order to do so. Do you know that the very latest polls in the United States indicate that the majority of Americans now, it went over 50%, the majority of Americans no longer attend church anywhere on Sunday. I'm telling you, the founders would be horrified because they believed citizens must stop. Remember George Washington said, even during the Revolutionary War, at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning, the entire Continental Army is to stop and worship God using either a chaplain or going to the nearest church building in order to do it. How important did they believe it was for, Christ for Americans to assemble to worship God even to the point of abstaining from labor to do so. And they further said that citizen obligations extends to the fact that we as citizens must possess personal, patriotic, sacrificial interest in our country. This is amazing, absolutely amazing. You know, I frequently cannot help but ask this question. Who were these men. Who were they? They were so unusual. Other than the characters that God has recorded for us and that are preserved in the Bible, amazing men and women that were faithful servants of God and accomplished great things, next to them, these were outstanding men who seemed to have been brought all together by providence for a particular time and place in order to accomplish the great that has been accomplished. You know, we are forced to conclude that the founders clearly believed that the very existence of the republic depends on citizen attachment to Christianity. Please don't miss this point. This is the supreme issue, and we must not miss the point. You may not choose to pursue Christianity. I've had people come up and say that. Well, you know, I'm a good moral person, and, and uh, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm upset about what's happening in the country. I don't like the way things are going, but I'm not really a church-going person. Well, all right, you may choose uh, not to pursue Christianity. Uh, you may not choose uh, to go to church. You may not choose to follow Christian morals, but I hope you understand from this study that the founders said, in order for our nation to be established, and in order for our nation to be perpetuated, to last, to endure, God and Christ must be acknowledged by a majority of our citizenry. That is America's most pressing concern. You know, it's one thing if you want to live in a, in a hedonistic state. Let's say that, you know, your goal, and obviously there are a number of people in our country that feel this way. Your goal is to change America into a religionless, a hedonistic, atheistic, socialist nation. You think that's the best thing for our country? That would be the best environment in which to live, although I'm surprised that those who feel that way are not willing to go to other countries on the earth where that's already well intact and live there. No, they want to turn America into that. Well, that's fine if you choose to do that. But listen, to deny and misrepresent 
America's Christian heritage is either gross ignorance or it is deliberate deceit, a ploy to get as much mileage as possible in a veiled attempt to subvert our civilization. You know what, what the ACLU and the organizations apparently that are like-minded do not understand or perhaps refuse to accept? is that the only reason that they are in a position in this country to spread their infidelity is because America has been a Christian-oriented nation. Now, that's the facts of the matter. They would not be allowed to have the influence and to perpetuate their ideas as they do in many other countries. I ask you this. What country in our lifetime is the premier atheistic nation on earth? A place where atheism was allowed to flourish. Where would that be? Well, in my lifetime, that's Russia. That's Russia. Well, I ask you, you want to go live there? Ask yourself this question. What country in our lifetime has been uh, the premier Hindu nation? on earth? Well, that, that would be India, a billion people. I ask you, you want to go live there? Well, what country or countries in our lifetime have been the premier Islamic nations on earth? Well, you know, you're talking about uh, Arabia, uh, Iraq, Iran, the most populous Muslim nation, Indonesia. I ask you, you want to go live in any of those countries? Many of them are coming here as fast as they can. So you see, every American who is thankful for the lifestyle that he or she enjoys is at the very least obligated to be grateful to those men who, by God's providence, orchestrated the founding of this country. Indeed, their official pronouncements merit as much consideration now as they did when originally announced. Imagine if a politician were to announce, uh, I'm going to be giving a speech, and all the television crews showed up, and they were going to broadcast this nationwide, and all that politician did was just read one of these pronouncements. Don't you know people would be upset and outraged? And then when he told them, well, by the way, my speech here is nothing more than a proclamation that the Founding Fathers issued. And yet that's exactly what needs to be done. Because what the founders talked about, the subjects that they set forth, the perspective that they promoted in those proclamations, need just as much consideration today as they did when they were originally announced. What possible motivation could atheists and, and social liberals and others have for wanting to eradicate Christianity from our civilization? Have you asked yourself that question? Why are we in a great culture war? Why is this even going on? Why is there so much tension and conflict and clashing in our civilization now as these two different views are going head to head? What is it that is so repugnant or threatening about Christianity that the bulk of Hollywood has such contempt and disdain for God and Christ and religious people? You know what the answer to that question is? Because Christianity calls upon people to restrain their fleshly, uh, generally sexual, appetites. It's really that simple. They seek to do whatever they want to do. They want to be able to live their life, do anything they want without guilt, without any accountability to a higher power than themselves. So you can understand to them, Christianity, Bible religion is contemptible and consequently, they essentially hate God, Christ, and the Bible. That's tragic. That is sad. Because there is a God. He actually exists. He is the God of the Bible. He created not only our minds, our spirits, but our bodies, and only He can tell us what will actually make us happy, contented people. So a person who thinks by indulging their flesh and engaging in sensual appetites that that's going to make me happy and I'll really have a contented life, that is not true. Most of the Hollywood crowd is miserable. 
They're unhappy. They're going from one thing to another, trying to seek happiness, and they're looking in all the wrong places, not looking in the very place that the founders themselves said we must look, which is what the Bible teaches. Consequently, our nation is going to have to be somehow turned back to the fountain for its source. Because you remember Solomon said in Proverbs 14, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we need to remember what the psalmist said. God in the past has rebuked other nations. Listen to him. You've rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Psalm 9 verse 5. Will God still do that today? You remember the psalmist said in Psalm 9 20, Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but Men. That's what we need a healthy dose of in our country. All of our leaders, all of our politicians need to humble themselves and recognize they are mere tools in this world. Oh, they're making their own decisions. They're acting by their own volition. But ultimately, they're headed down a pathway that will end in only one of two possible eternal destinations. You remember the founder, the father of our country made this incredible statement. George Washington, I am sure there never was a people who had more reason to acknowledge a divine interposition in their affairs than those of the United States. And I should be pained to believe that they have forgotten that agency which was so often manifested during our revolution or that they failed to consider the omnipotence of that God who, listen to this, who is alone able to protect them. What a tremendous statement, full of woeful tomes. We can't help but ask the question, is that what's happened? Has America forgotten 